Well, good morning, everyone. This is Thursday morning. It's 9.15. And um, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 13. So you can open your Bibles there as we continue through and we're almost done this letter to the Hebrews. But we're in Hebrews 13 and... Um, I will try to, after this is done, I upload it on my, from my computer to another program and then either Gene Anderson or Christy Martin puts it on the website, okay? So you can access it along with the notes. Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Thank you, our Father, for the preciousness of your word. Help us to not only understand the the intent the original intent of the author but behind the human author the intent and the word of the lord and through your spirit and so may we appreciate it and may we live by it in jesus name amen hebrews chapter 13 now Notice your notes. Um, about, I think there's four pages of notes. But uh, notice our review of the book of Hebrews. Chapters 1 through 6. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of God. The God-man is a superior person. He's greater than the prophets, the angels, Moses and Aaron, and these Hebrews, Jews, highly valued under the old covenant, the ministry of prophets, the angels, the law was given through the angels, by angels to Moses, to the people. And then they also highly valued Moses and Aaron, who represents the priesthood of the Old Testament. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the God-man, is not only a superior person, but a superior priest, and he exercises a superior priesthood. That's chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. Jesus was designated a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and that is a big issue he is not a priest in the order of Aaron. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, verse 4. And then his priesthood operates from a better covenant, not the old Mosaic covenant, but the new covenant. It operates in a better sanctuary, not the earthly one, the tabernacle and later the temple, which are a copy of that which is in heaven. And he operates with a better sacrifice, a sacrifice whose efficacy, effectiveness, is beyond question. And then in chapters 11, 12, and 13, we have the superior principle. And that is the superior principle by which we live and walk is faith. We walk, we live, by faith, not by sight. Trusting God, we can't see. We don't walk by sight. You know, touching, smelling, hearing, tasting, seeing. Those are our senses in this physical world. But we walk by faith. We trust God. What he, where he said, where he has said we come from, where we're going, what he has laid out for the future, and his will as revealed in his word. So we live by faith, not by sight. In chapter 11, we have the examples of faith. The ancients who lived by faith, believed God's word, sometimes died and suffered greatly for believing it. But they were looking forward to a city whose architect and builder was God. They're, they were aliens and strangers on this earth. Chapter 12, we have encouragements to faith, to bolster our faith, encouragements. 
And then our focus now is chapter 13, the evidences of faith. Evidences of faith. Hebrews 12, 28, the last verse of chapter 12 says this. Well, 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. How can we do that? How can we worship God acceptably with ever evident? Boy, I can't even get it. I worship God acceptably with reverence <laughs> and awe. How can we do that? What does that look like? Well, chapter 13 spells it out. Okay, first of all, last week we looked at the first three verses. We're to, we're to be loving. We looked at why love is so important. Um, we, we examined who are we to love. Verse one says, love each other as brothers. We're to love each other. Verse two, we're to love strangers. Don't forget to entertain strangers. Okay, and then... Verse 3 talks about prisoners and those who have been mistreated. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So we're to be loving. That's how we worship God with reverence and awe acceptably as God ought to be worshipped. That's how we do it. Loving. Number two, pure. Be pure. Verse 4 talks about marriage. Marriage is to be honored by all. Why? Because God established marriage. It is not a man-made institution. God established it. He gave us the parameters and the rules, and we are to honor marriage and the rules and guidelines that God has established and goes along with it. But the world dishonors marriage. You know, and we looked at it about four or five different ways in which the world is in rebellion against the creator and dishonors marriage. And then the marriage bed is to be kept pure. And, and the Lord says here, the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. And we saw how God judges fornicators and adulterers or the sexually immoral and adulterers. Okay, now we come to our text for today, Hebrews 13, verse 7 through 17. Okay? And, well, I'm sorry, verses 5 and 6, first of all. The, the third area is be content. Look at verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So because of that, we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So we are to be content, be loving, be pure, be content, verses five and six. Now, the first thing we, we notice here in our notes is the admonition in the beginning of verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. The admonition that we're to keep our lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, with what we have. Um. We want, to, we want to go to another passage of Scripture that elaborates on contentment and this whole issue of money. Turn back with me in your Bibles, okay? Keep your place there in Hebrews 13 and go back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6 because 1 Timothy chapter 6 is all about money and material possessions. Um especially beginning at verse 3. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, down through uh, verse 20, or down through the end of the chapter, actually verse 19. Okay, 3 to 19 of chapter 6, all about material possessions. False teachers see godliness, see religion as a means to financial gain, the end of verse 5. 
Uh, verse 9 talks about people who want to get rich. And verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth. So all the, this whole last section of 1 Timothy is about material possessions and the things of this world and people who want to get rich and, and they make a disaster of their lives and their marriages and so forth. And then people who are rich, how they're supposed to be generous and how they're supposed to be giving. And then false teachers see religion or godliness as a means to financial gain. And they exploit people for money using religion, talking Jesus, okay? But really padding their, their uh, bank accounts. All right, so look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. The admonition is keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Well, this also says the same thing, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich, I mean they really want to, they're They've, they've swallowed hook, line, and sinker, sinker, the dictates of this world. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people... Some believers, some professing believers, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. They just get diverted away from the Lord. They've wandered from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs, many griefs. So what do we learn? And there, it's in your notes here, A, B, C, and D. First of all, wealth does not bring contentment. It really doesn't. Wealth does not bring contentment. I know you can say this to your blue in your face to people. They don't believe it. They think it does. Paul gives the secret of true, the secret, the true secret of contentment in Philippians chapter 4. Remember that passage? He gives the true secret of contentment in Philippians 4. He says this in verse 11. I am not saying this because I'm in need for I have learned, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, okay? And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here's the secret. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the secret, dear people. The secret is I can do everything, everything that the Lord allows in his providence. I can do everything through him who gives me strength to do it. That's the secret of contentment. So wealth does not bring contentment. True contentment comes from godliness in our hearts. We are godly-focused people, God-focused, not wealth in the hand. That's where contentment comes from, godliness. God is chief and prime in our lives, and we our minds are set on things above. Not wealth in the hand. That doesn't bring contentment. The more you get, the more you want. When we focus on material things, our having will never catch up with our wanting. Never. It's one of, the, it's one of our sinful flesh, flesh's unbreakable laws. The more we get, the more we want. We're never satisfied. It's never enough. We're to free ourselves from that. Keep your lives free from the love of money and then 1 Timothy, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6, actually. So uh, keep, keep looking there at that passage. This is just a, uh, you know, a parallel thought here. Secondly, wealth is not lasting. Verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into the world, 
okay? And we can take nothing out of it. It's not lasting. Someone else someday is going to enjoy your wealth. Everything you earned, everything you bought, everything you enjoy, somebody else is going to enjoy it, use it, maybe waste it, maybe, um, but it's all going to eventually be gone. Nothing in, nothing out. We brought nothing in, we take nothing out. We are born naked and penniless. And when we die and are buried, we are naked and penniless again. We come in naked and penniless, we go out naked and penniless. With regard to earthly possessions, our entry and our exit are identical. So our life on earth, what is our life on earth? Our life on earth is a brief pilgrimage between two moments of nakedness. It should, inf and, it, and that thought, dear people, should influence our economic lifestyle. It should influence. We should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And our view of wealth and the pilgrimage on this earth that we have and the gift of God's grace should influence our economic lifestyle. Possessions are only the traveling luggage of time. They're not the stuff of eternity. It would be sensible to travel light and as Jesus himself commanded us not to store up for ourselves treasures, not, not to store up, to accumulate selfishly treasures on this earth. Three, or point C, our basic needs are easily met. Verse eight, but if we have food and clothing, literally covering, so it's talking not only about clothing and you know, jackets and, you know, taking, taking care of our bodies, covering them, for warmth and propriety and all that stuff. But uh, it's not only covering, is not only clothing, but shelter as well. You got a place to live? Well, make it nice, make it homey, but be content with it, all right? Um, if we have food and if we have clothing, we're going to be content with that. Those are our needs. Shelter and food. Our basic needs are easily met. And then lastly, the desire for wealth leads to sin. And not only to sin, but all kinds of horror. Look what it says once again. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. Okay, they, they get caught. And into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men to ruin and destruction. The, root, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, all kinds of hardship, ruin, destruction, many griefs. People eager for money wander from the faith and they pierce themselves with many griefs, many griefs. It's so sad. So we're not to do that. All right. So that's the admonition. Now, now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 13 and look at the explanation in um, uh, the second part of verse 5. We're to keep our lives free from the love of money and be content. Why? Because listen to what God said. Here's the explanation <coughs> or the support for that admonition. He says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now that is a quote from Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 from the law, from the book of Deuteronomy. What did God say? Now, I want you to notice this verse. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. What you can't see about that verse is what it looks like in the Greek text, in the Greek manuscript, okay? We have a, I have a Greek New Testament. I use it, um, and it's based upon many manuscripts, 6,500 that we have, um, Greek manuscripts that we've collected and they go way back to the first, to the second, third centuries and then all centuries after that, especially the earlier ones. But the point I'm saying is this, what this verse literally says is that there are five negatives in this verse. Now you say, well, I only see two. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. 
I only see two. Yeah, but in the Greek text, there's five. You're just going to have to believe me. Five negatives are used in this statement to emphasize the impossibility of God deserting believers. It's like saying there is absolutely no way whatsoever that I will ever, ever leave you. Okay, it's, that's what he's saying. There is absolutely no way whatsoever that I will ever, ever leave you. Or literally, you want it the most literal? Never, never will I leave you. Never, never, never will I forsake you. Did you see what I did? Never, never will I, will I leave you. Never, never, never will I forsake you. Five negatives. I hope you get the point. That's why we can be free from the love of money and be content. Now, where did God say this? Well, he said it in, he said it in, Deuter in Genesis 28, I am with you, will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. What about this one? Joshua 1.5 No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And one more, 1 Chronicles 28.20 David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. So there's the explanation. Now we have a further affirmation. Notice the affirmation of confidence, verse 6. So in light of the admonition and in light of the explanation from Deuteronomy, we can say with confidence, we can affirm with confidence the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's the aff affirmation. What can man? It comes from Psalm 118, verses 6 and 7. The Lord is my helper. I can say that with confidence. Can you? Can you say that? The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord will make a way. That is a promise he has said. Now the application of this, we've looked at the admonition, the explanation, the affirmation, now the application. Experiencing contentment, how to become satisfied with what we have. Okay, number one, or point A, this is just applicational, folks. This is for you and for me. We must realize, not just acknowledge, but truly realize God's goodness. Do you think God's good? Do you think that God is good all the time? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We must realize truly that God is good. Secondly, <coughs> we should realize, not just acknowledge, but truly realize God is omniscient. Jesus assures us your Father knows that you need these things. God is omniscient. Your Father knows that you need these things. Do we really believe that? He knows all things. He knows your situation. He knows what you need. And not only is he good, but he's omniscient. Thirdly, we should recognize God's supremacy, God's sovereignty. Regarding material things, listen to Hannah's words. From the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. Samuel's mother, Hannah, listened to her words. The Lord makes poor and rich. It is the Lord who makes poor and who makes rich. You say, well, wait a second. How does that help me? Well, 
God does not have the same plan for all his children. What he lovingly gives to one, he just as lovingly withholds from another, may withhold from another. The Holy Spirit gives a variety of gifts, ministries, and effects, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. In regard to material blessings, Hannah said the Lord makes rich and poor. If he were to make us rich, let's just think about this. If he were to make you rich, we might be of outstanding service to him. There are a lot of wealthy people that have, and believers over the years, that have been faithful to God. They have done well. And if God, if God were to make us rich, we might be of outstanding service to him. On the other hand, our becoming rich might be our spiritual undoing. The Lord knows what we need and will provide us with no less. God's in charge. He makes poor and he makes rich. Fourth, we should continually remind ourselves what true riches are. We've got to remind ourselves what true riches are. If you're a believer, you're rich. Okay? It is the worldly, the people of this world, the inhabitants of this earth. That's unbelievers. It is the unbeliever. It is the worldly, including the wealthy worldly, who are poor. Those people are poor. They've got 100 years or 105 years or 82 years or sometimes 70-something years or sometimes 38 years. Who knows? But life on this earth is a brief, it's like a vapor that appears for a little while and it's gone. And every one of us, I just turned 65. I cannot believe it. I, I, am, a, I am young. I am a teenager in a 65-year-old body. And I know all of you say that too. We are older. Our lives have gone so fast. We've, we've graduated from high school. We've gone to college, went to seminary, got married, had children, had my ministry first nine years, then been here at McCoy, and here we are. My life is three quarters of the way over with. I mean, humanly speaking. So, it's almost over. And that's true with the lost. Their lives are short. It is the worldly, including the wealthy, who are poor. It, and it is believers, including poor ones, who are rich. Who are rich. We have an inheritance. We have been born again into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, fade, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God unto the day that is yet coming. We are rich. I mean, for all eternity, we're not going to be part of this broken world, this sin-cursed broken world. These aging, frail, virus, susceptible bodies, okay? We're going to be free from this. We're going to have glorified bodies, and we're going to be with the Lord, not in hell. You're rich. So we, we, gotta, we gotta get our values right. Lastly, supremely, contentment comes from communion with God. Fellowship. I am the vine, you are the branches. We got to stay connected. Com contentment comes from communion with God. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 73. Well, first of all, the more we focus on him, the less we'll be concerned about anything material. When you are near Jesus Christ, you are overwhelmed with the riches that you have in him and earthly possessions simply do not matter. What's the, what does the hymn say? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory, in the light of his grace. Psalm 73 says this, Whom have I in heaven but you, Lord? And on and earth has nothing I desire beside you. Earth offers nothing. 
that I desire, that I want, beside you. Whom have I in heaven but you? Nothing in heaven or on earth is more desirable than knowing the Lord and having fellowship with our Creator and, and, and then our Redeemer. So, be content. Be content. Contentment is very, very important. And we are, that is one way that we worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. That's a third way. Here's a fourth way. Be loyal. Be loyal. Now this is, verses 7 through 17, have to do with our response to God-appointed leadership in the church. Our response to God-appointed leadership. We are to be loyal to God-appointed leadership. Now, in our church, we have pastors, two pastors, and we have nine deacons. That is the leadership team of our church. And one of the expectations of members in our church is that we are to be loyal. Our response to God-appointed leadership is loyalty. And that is the thought in verses 7 through 17. Leaders take preeminence here in this passage of Scripture. Um, Beginning at verse 7, the writer instructs us to be loyal to church leadership. Leadership is the focal point of the remainder of this chapter, basically. Look at verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Verse 24 talks about, look at verse 20, I mean verse 20, talks about the great shepherd of the sheep. May the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. And then in verse 24, greet all your leaders and all God's people. So leadership takes preeminence in this passage, especially verses 7 through 17. Leadership was in bullet point number three in your notes. Leadership was important in the Old Testament. Okay, God appointed leadership over his people. There were kings, there were prophets, there were priests. And the welfare of Israel nationally was largely dependent on the effectiveness of its leadership. But how the people responded to their leaders was also a significant factor in whether the nation would be blessed or judged by God. Unfortunately, God's people themselves often turned against their leaders and brought condemnation on themselves. That happened frequently in the Old Testament. For example, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 26. Here's what Nehemiah says in his prayer about the people of Israel praying to God, but they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They put your law behind their backs They killed your prophets. See, leadership, God sent prophets to them to keep them. Don't put God's law behind your backs, but they didn't like it. So they killed your prophets who had admonished them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies, so you handed them over to their enemies who oppressed them. So they suffered for their rebellion against God-appointed leadership. (coughs) bullet point number four God has instituted positions of leadership in the New Testament church as well Ephesians 4 God gave some to be apostles, prophets uh, evangelists pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry All right, Acts 14 wherever Paul went he and planted churches he appointed elders 
in those churches. Titus 1.5, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul greeted the church and all the overseers and deacons. And 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 13, Paul gives qualifications for overseers and deacons. So God has instituted positions of leadership in the New Testament church. Leadership is important. I like this statement from Chuck Swindoll. In every area of life, leadership is essential. To chart the way, light the way, and lead the way. But sometimes we find our confidence in leadership shaken. We wonder if we haven't gone blindly down the wrong road following some persuasive pied piper to our destruction. When there is a crisis in leadership, there is a crumbling of credibility. When there is a breakdown of personal ethics in the lives of our leaders, there is a breach of public trust. And when we have been burned by a leader, it's difficult to warm up to the fiery rhetoric of the next person who steps up to the podium. Nevertheless, leadership is, an essential, is as essential to religion as a captain is to the safe voyage of a ship. With it, that is with leadership, we always run the risk of running aground on the reef. But without it, we would never even get out of port. From the fall of the Roman Empire to the fall of a tele-evangelist empire, the thing that makes poor leaders topple is often power that has gone to their heads. Maybe they thought they were above the law. Maybe they thought no one would find out. Maybe they thought a noble end justified any notorious means used to achieve it. Whatever the case, the wreckage caused by ungodly leadership is strewn throughout the pages of history. But, folks, God has appointed leaders. Okay? Now, what is the function of leaders? I'm speaking primarily of elders, overseers, pastors in the New Testament church. What is the function of leaders? What are they to do? Here's just a quick survey. First of all, they are and this is primary, they are to carefully guard their own relationship with God and with other people. I am to guard my relationship. Watch over yourselves, Paul says, and all the flock. Notice what's first. Carefully guard, I am to carefully guard, and Christopher is, and our deacons are. We're to carefully guard our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. Okay? We're to guard it. Secondly, we're to feed God's people, God's sheep, his precious word. We're to feed them the word of God. We're to feed ourselves, this, the buffet of the word. We're to be men of God who know the word and we're able to feed the church, the word of God. Thirdly, we're to warn God's people of false doctrine and teachers. And that is true. Now, some people don't like that. We should never speak against everyone. Let's just love Jesus all together. Well, there are some people in Jesus' name that don't know and understand the Bible. And they're twisting it, perverting it, corrupting it, adding to the gospel, and doing all kinds of things, and confusing God's people. We are, as leaders, part of protecting the sheep. We are to warn God's people of false doctrines, and teachers. Fourth, we're to equip God's people to do the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4. It's not the job of pastors and evangelists and prophets and people like this and teachers to do all the work of the ministry. Okay? We are to equip God's people to get involved in the work of ministry. There's no church that can have just pastors doing the work of ministry. You're not going to have much ministry. Well, we'll just get more pastors. Yeah, even that, they're not, it's not going to get done. So we're to equip God's people to do the work of ministry. And then fifthly, we are to rule, oversee, and manage 
Christ's church. We are to oversee, to rule. We're to oversee membership, oversee church discipline procedures. We're to put into place policies and guidelines and see that they're carried out for the good of the church and the good of the people. We are to do that. We are to rule, manage, oversee. Do leaders fail? Sure they do. And I don't mean, I don't mean to be light about that. I can, I can tell you why leaders fail. Because the curse of sin guarantees that all human authority will fail in one way or another. We're, we're dealing with human beings who are sinners. Saved, yes, but the curse of sin guarantees that all human authority will fail in one way or another at some time or another. Okay? I have here a study I did. I don't I remember exactly, but victorious living under imperfect authority. How do we live victoriously and bring honor to God when we are placed under imperfect authority? And there's all kinds of authority, folks. It's not just pastors. Children are to obey their parents. Do parents fail? Victorious living. Wives are to submit to their husbands, even ungodly, unsaved ones. 1 Peter 3. Church, membered, church members are to submit to pastors and deacons. Employees are to submit to employers. Everybody is to, is to submit to government authorities. All believers are to submit to each other. All believers are to submit to God. So submission and authority is part of this world system. It's part of how God created things because it's a reflection of the creator and the relationship among in the Trinity. The head of Christ is God. Okay, so... Jesus submitted to his father. So submission and authority are part of it. So we are to, we are to be loyal to the leaders that God has placed over us in the church. Now, in verse 7, he talks about loyalty to former leaders. Okay? Loyalty to former leaders. Let me get to the proper place here that I need to be. Point number one, I think this is the last page, no, second to the last, loyalty to former leaders. Verse seven says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. <clears throat> now the New Living Translation reads this way, Rem remember your leaders who first taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and trust the Lord as they do. Okay? So the first command here is he says, he gives two commands to these people concerning their leaders, especially those that had served at first when they, when they evangelized and first came among them. You know, it, it appears from verse 7 that these leaders that they're to remember and consider and imitate are no longer there anymore. All right? They were the founders. It's kind of like Hebrews. Go, to, go with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Back to chapter 2. And look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, the Lord Jesus, his ministry, it was first announced by Jesus. Notice it's what it says, was confirmed to us, was spoken to us by those who heard him. And God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we have three groups of people. We have Jesus who first announced it, those who heard him and were discipled by him, his disciples, and then us, these Hebrews. All right, so this salvation first spoken by the Lord, it was confirmed and delivered to us 
by those who heard him. They were the leaders that he's talking about here. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. They were your spiritual fathers. Now, um, let me just apply this a little bit. You know, who are your leaders? I mean, you think of various pastors that have served in this church, and some of you go back beyond my time here. But there are other leaders in our lives that God has provided. People have had a profound influence on us. Close your eyes. This comes from Chuck Swindoll, too. Close your eyes and take a mental trip back to the art gallery of your spiritual memory. Whose pictures are on those walls? Among them, surely, are a few that stand out. I know there are for me. A Sunday school teacher, perhaps, who endured your antics and somehow got across to you the patience of God. Maybe a grandparent who filled your imagination with the stories of David and Goliath and Noah's Ark. It may have been a youth worker who invested time and love in you or just a friend who wouldn't let spiritual issues slide. I know I've got several people in my mind right now. One guy is named Furman Martin. Furman Martin, when I was a teenager in Simsbury Baptist Church, I grew up there until I went off to college, Lancaster Bible College, but Furman Martin, as my Sunday school teacher, as my mentor, took me under his wing for a good portion of, of my child. My dad wasn't saved. My mom was, my dad wasn't. But Furman Martin took me under his wing. And you know what? He lives in Jupiter, Florida to this day. Now I'm 65. He lives in Jupiter, Florida. And I had contact with him, oh, about five, six years ago when I was in Florida. I drove down to see him and had lunch. And then I got a Christmas card from him just recently. Oh, well, you know, this last Christmas or the one before it, and he said, Ray, and he told me this before too, I pray for you every day. I pray for you all these years. This man has had a profound influence. He used to take me sailing. We'd go out to the Long Island Sound down in Connecticut right after church. We'd jump, and go, drive an hour down, get in on the Long Island Sound. We'd sail all evening in the summer months. I mean, all the afternoon, and we'd get home at dark. But we did that every week throughout the summer. But he had a great influence on my life. So you have people in your pictures on those walls, the gallery of your spiritual memory. So we're to remember them. Then secondly, he says, consider the outcome of their way of life. You know, look at their way of life, the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. People that have ministered the word of God to you, imitate their faith. Look at, study their life, the outcome of it. What made them so successful? I'm not talking about money-wise. But what made them so influential? Imitate that. Chuck Swindoll goes on, but what are we to do with our memories of these people? The verse says to consider the result of their conduct. The word consider means to look up a subject, to investigate, and to observe accurately. Don't just glance at those portraits and gloss over them in fond reminiscence. Stop and gaze at them. Recall what it was about that coach that made such a difference in your life. Figure out how that pastor kept you coming back Sunday after Sunday and imitate those things. Incorporate them into your life. Those kinds of role models are gifts from God, gifts that go on giving long after the person is gone from our lives. And these people were gone, these original leaders. But remember them, consider them. Well, the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, point number C in verse 8, all of a sudden now, he says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. 
Notice my note there. It's actually a quote from Homer Kent and his book on Hebrews. What about Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep? <coughs> Listen to this quote, or look at it. Perhaps some had a tendency in this church, to the Hebrews, to feel that times had changed since their first encounter with the Christian faith. Time had gone on, and that their former leader's faith was no longer relevant to them. If so, they are here reminded that Jesus Christ, the very one who was proclaimed by the leaders of yesterday, has not changed. He doesn't change. His person, and consequently, the doctrine about him, remains the same even today. And because he is the eternal Son of God, he remains the same forever. That's a great thought, isn't it? Leaders, folks, come and go. Okay, Jesus Christ is the great shepherd of the sheep. It says that in verse 20. That great shepherd of the sheep. In John chapter 10, verses 11 and 14, talks about Jesus Christ is the good shepherd of the sheep. And in 1 Peter 5, verse 4, he is the chief shepherd. So Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, and the great shepherd of the sheep. And pastors and church leaders are under shepherds, under the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. And here's the point. Leaders come and go, okay? But Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Lord of the church. Leaders, they get old. They, they have different callings. Um, they're here. They go. And that's just the way it is. But Jesus Christ never changes. He's the great shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And he loves his church. And you know what? He can always provide another leader. Always can do that. It's God's work. It's God's plan. And there are other people there that can take up the torch. Okay, the baton as we pass it on. So, uh, to former leaders. Then in verse 17, in verse 17, he talks about their current leaders. Look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, here he's addressing their current leaders. Notice my note, if former leaders were to be recognized and their teachings retained, present ones, current leaders, were to be obeyed and submitted to. Their responsibility before God was to be recognized and honored by, the, by these Hebrews. Their responsibility before God and the role that they served was to be recognized and their shepherding tasks should not be complicated by disobedience, rebellion, resistance by God's people, his sheep. The author's counsel regarding his reader's current God-appointed leadership was to obey them and submit to their authority those who have the rule over you. Okay? I mean, throughout the New Testament, we find the same thing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love because of their work. Live, at, live in peace with each other. So, he says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. Why? Why? Well, he gives three reasons, A, B, and C. Number one, because they keep watch over our souls. They keep watch over your souls. That's what he says. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Now, that is an interesting verb, keep watch. They keep watch. Do you know that the night was divided up into four watches, right? 
In Jewish time, the night began at six o'clock. Okay, so there was six to nine, first watch. There was nine to 12, the second watch. 12 to three, <coughs> the third watch. And three to six, the fourth watch. The night had four watches. And literally, they're called that way because some people, while everyone else was sleeping, some people stayed awake and guarded and watched. Well, you're to submit and obey God-ordained authority because they keep watch. That, 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 that literally means they search for sleep. They search for sleep. It's the picture of someone staying awake at night, of a person who is seeking sleep but can't find it, and of a person so burdened with concern for others that it keeps this person awake at night. They keep watch over your souls, sometimes through the night, because sleep, physical sleep won't come. Secondly, why are we, we to obey and submit? Because it says they must give an account of their stewardship over the flock of God where they serve as shepherds. That's a frightening thought. I am going to give an account of my ministry in Michigan City for eight and a half years. Can't remember, it was eight or more toward nine, but it was something like that. But I, I was over those people as a pastor for eight and a half years. And I'm going to give an account for my time there before Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd. I'm just his under shepherd. I'm going to give an account of my stewardship over God's flock. And I'm going to give an account over my, for my oversight of the ministry of McCoy Memorial Baptist Church. So isn't former pastors. And there are 12 before me. They're going to give an account of their stewardship before the Lord. So there's another reason why you should obey and submit because I'm going to give an account and others are too. <clears throat> and then lastly, point C, so that they might be relieved of grief. Look what he says. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them, now notice, so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. Sometimes, folks, ministry is a burden. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Because I'm going to give an account. Okay? So that they may be relieved of grief. The term means to groan. They may be relieved of groaning. Once again, Chuck Swindoll makes this comment. There's probably no profession more emotionally enervating. Now, I had to, re I had to look that word up. I didn't know quite what that was. Enervating sounds like energizing. No, that's not what it means. There's probably no profession more emotionally enervating, exhausting, wearying, sapping, draining than pastoral work. It's filled with all kinds of groanings within the spirit that are often too deep for words. And that's true. So, we're to consider... Now, notice there's a warning at the end of verse 17, for that would be of no advantage to you. <laughs> if we resist, if we cause leadership grief through whatever means, resistance, bucking, questioning, complaining, griping, um, I don't know what, you know, just not being willing to serve the Lord. If we resist this type of God-appointed leadership over our lives, we lose. We lose. It's unprofitable for us. It's of no advantage. That's the NIV. It's of no advantage. And so submitting becomes a matter not only of expedience, 
it is in our own best interest. Because leaders are going to give an account before the Lord of not only their leadership, but also of the churches they serve and the sheep that they were over, that they ministered to. And so obeying and submitting is not only a matter of expedience, it is in our own best interest. Now, it sounds like I'm, please understand, it sounds like I'm promoting myself or trying to ever get everyone to obey me. That's not really what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to teach the word of God. This is what it's talking about. So whether I'm here or somebody else is eventually here and when I'm not a pastor anymore, but I'm, a, I'm part of a church and I'm going there, to that particular church and I become a member. I want to I wanna be effective in that work. I want to do something for the Lord. I want to stand behind the leadership and, and realize the pressures that are there and be somebody that is a blessing, coming alongside, helping. So it's not about me. It's about just the concept of leadership in the New Testament that, that are... Leaders that are under the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. Under shepherds, under them, under the Lord. Okay, now, <coughs> I'm looking at the clock and it's one hour. And so, I am going to hold off on the rest of these notes till next week. All right, and then we're going to finish up, I think, next Wednesday night the end of the month of April, but I'm not, I'm not going to get to this third thing about a word about legalism, and that's actually verse 9 through verse 16 because when it comes to leadership in the church and pastors and teachers in the church that are to be obeyed and submitted to and remembered, okay, there's also false teachers. There's also people who are going to fill the church. There's many warnings throughout the New Testament, many, many warnings about false teachers. And they're going to come in. They're going to be savage wolves. They're going to tickle people's ears. They're going to introduce destructive heresies. And so there's also the bad side. And these people, these Hebrews were being, look at verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. And there were those that were pulling them, drawing them, wooing them, tickling ears, making false teaching sound attractive, making it look like, well, you know, that makes sense. And they were there. So when it comes to this matter of leadership, there is good leadership and there's also bad leadership. There's false teachers. That's that are that we're bringing in legalism, uh, taking them back under some strange forms of Judaism, beginning well in verses nine through sixteen. So we'll look at that next time, and then we'll jump down to verse eighteen and finish up the book. Okay, thanks for your patience. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that we have really come to a deeper appreciation of the book of Hebrews. It, it so honors the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, um, after the order of Melchizedek. He's so much better, so superior, greater than anything under the old covenant. And thank you that we, we are part of a local church. And thank you that we stand upon the authority of the Bible. Help us to be faithful to it, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time.